Carano. Grows great when old. All right, here is Economics Explained, which is ironic because if I'm not mistaken, this channel itself is like kind of neolib, right? Um, but uh, even they are recognizing the condition that the younger generations are now in. Younger generations are now poorer than their parents, and it's changing our economy. Men economies. plant trees whose shade they know they shall never sit in. A Greek proverb from a time well before the problems of our modern economies or the study of economics itself is as true today as- Chat, it's important. Even when you have people who are like centrist uh, on economics, even when you have neoliberals recognizing that social mobility is completely eviscerated for the next generation, even if they're not going to do this from a class, uh, you know, class dynamics perspective, it doesn't matter. Oftentimes, I have talked about how Generation Z, you know, millennials, boomers, like that kind of generational uh, consolidation is actually counter-revolutionary. It's like literally anti-Marxian thought because the only two classes that are supposed to matter are the bourgeois, the capital owners, and the workers. And uh, this generational divide is simply a way to distract, just like the middle class is. The understanding of what a middle class is fundamentally undermines Marxian orthodoxy and Marxist economics in general. That is the deliberate design for what middle class and upper middle class and like, you know, the wealthy, uh, that distinction is literally made up by people who subscribe to neoclassical economics, okay? And it's done on purpose. Same with the like I said, generational divide. Um, it is, that's the reason why everyone always says, well, the next generation is going to be better. And then it never ends up happening. You're like, what the f Why didn't it happen? Well, it doesn't happen because it's fake, okay? <laughs> it's not real. It's just a bait and switch. It's for you to misdirect your attention away from the true class contradiction that exists under capitalism and the capitalist mode of, of uh, production and the relations that the working class has to the means of production. Uh, there are 60-year-old grocery baggers who will never retire to generational divide means jack shit. It's like blaming immigrants for taking her jabs. Exactly. Yes, material relations get reproduced regardless of how young or old people are. Exactly. But the point I'm making here is that sometimes watch neoliberals fundamentally think that your worldview if you are a marxist that fundamentally think your worldview is wrong right <sighs> those people also recognize the dire uh the dire future prospects of the upcoming generation so that's important as it was thousands of years ago but do we really middle class doesn't exist no it is it's not a real distinction i mean most distinctions are arbitrary and made up obviously including the class one that i'm referencing under uh marxian economics however however having said that there are useful distinctions and distinctions that are not or, or designations that are useful and designations that are not useful contextually speaking uh, saying things like the professional managerial class or saying things like the middle class saying things like the upper middle class and the wealthy versus actually dividing the uh, classes into the, with with respect to their relations to their means of production is a, a more valuable tool if you are a marxist if you are a leftist it is about as i just farted 756 pointed out it is about labor versus capital really live by this idea for the first time since the industrial revolution successive generations are not becoming wealthier than their parents while there have certainly been setbacks and historical outliers from this trend, it has remained true in aggregate for the populations of most developed economies. For a long time, it was simply the expectation that people's children would have a better lifestyle in their adulthood than they did. But today, but today that's no not fucking real. I gotta in fact, pee. Most young professionals can only aspire to live the lifestyles that their parents did. Younger generations are finding it harder and harder to get reliable jobs, afford comfortable homes, start a family, and save for retirement. This is despite the fact that the world is a much richer place today than it was at any point in the 20th century when baby boomers were busy building their now unassailable fortunes. So, what is going on here? How is it that a world that is richer overall, producing generations that are poorer than the ones that preceded them? Is there some underlying cause to this? If there is, is there some way to reverse it? And if there isn't, does that mean that we can only expect every generation going forward to be poorer than the one that came before it from now on? Oh, and I suppose it's probably also worth asking, does this even matter, since everyone is eventually going to die and pass down their wealth anyway? Here's a question for you all. Is it better to be born into a large cohort with lots of people the same age as you, or a small cohort with not a lot of people the same age as you? Traditional economic theory would suggest that a small cohort is preferable. It means less competition for jobs, housing, social programs, spots in good schools, and on a macro level, less competition for things as basic as natural resources. 
But how then do you explain the baby boomers, which despite being part of the largest population explosion ever, are in aggregate very wealthy? Well, Lord David Willits, a British politician, demographer and author, suggests that the opposite may be true, and that in a democratic system being part of a larger cohort is actually preferable because it gives that group more voting power on generational issues and more sway in marketplaces. When the boomers were young, they voted for policies that benefited them. Low cost or free higher education, family support systems and strong social welfare. When they got to the peaks of their careers, their voting patterns changed again, and now this large block of voters was in favour of lower income taxes, less business regulation, more domestic industry protections to avoid outsourcing and global competition, and on a smaller scale, things like zoning laws which would protect the value of their homes. The push towards suburbs with mandated single family building requirements meant that houses got bigger and good locations got more desirable because only so many family homes could be built there. In the 50s, houses were basically a commodity. The majority of the expense was in building the structure itself and it wasn't unreasonable for the family cars to cost more than the family home. Fast forward 50 years and those houses are now investments as much as they are places to live. In old age, the boomers have now started voting to support retirement benefits, pension schemes, medical infrastructure and to remove wealth taxes, even if that comes at the expense of all the schemes that serve them well in their young age. Of course, David Willett's work focuses specifically on the UK, and yes, I know there are certainly people that vote for the greater good rather than their narrow self-interest, but on average it is easy to see this trend throughout the past half century in most advanced economies. In my own home of Australia, for example, the 2019 federal election was more or less decided by a policy decision that would reduce the tax effectiveness of Australian retirement accounts. The party that advocated for keeping the favourable tax structure ended up winning, primarily thanks to older Australian voters. We recently just had another election where that opposition party backed down on their plan to change retirement account taxes, and they won. Very convincingly. A 2017 British election study found that over time, votes for conservative parties have shifted from being divided by rich and working class to being divided by young and old. A lot of what I have discussed so far came directly from Willett's book, The Pinch, and a lecture he ran at the Royal Institution. It's definitely worth a read if you are interested in these demographic processes. Now a lifetime of favourable government policy can be hugely beneficial to building wealth. Imagine how much better off the average millennial would be if they got free college or secondary schooling. Even all other things being equal, this would be the difference that a lot of young people need to be able to put a deposit on a house. And that's the next big issue to consider. The housing divide. David Willett's small cohort theory probably omits, or at least doesn't emphasise, one important detail that gave baby boomers another advantage over successive generations. And no, it's not simply that they were able to buy houses when they were cheap, certainly that didn't hurt, but it's more a symptom of a bigger issue. They were a big cohort in a small The video is young generations are now poorer than their parents and is changing our economies. World. They had all of the voting power and hardly any of the competition. In the 1950s and 1960s, the global population was roughly a third of what it is today. And not to start a whole thing here, but if you were a white man in the countries that we are mostly focusing on, your competition was even less severe. So this added back all of the apparent trade-offs that we thought of earlier. There really was less competition for basically everything, including jobs, because employers had a smaller pool of labour to choose from. Labour force participation amongst women was very low, which further reduced the supply and hence the bargaining power of workers. But it also meant that domestic duties were normally taken care of, which reduced household expenditures on things like childcare, food and general maintenance. These higher relative incomes combined with lower outgoings meant that houses could often be paid off with as little as one year's income. Yes, they did have to endure higher interest rates, especially in the 70s and 80s which were their peak home buying decades, but it didn't really make the difference it would today. The median home in the USA in 1985 was $82,000. That's median, so 50% of homes, like the ones first home buyers would be looking at, would be cheaper than this, but let's keep it simple and stick with $82,000. Adjusted for median household incomes, that $82,000 becomes $103,000. The average mortgage rate at this time was 15%, or roughly $15,000 per year. It did get higher in certain years, but most borrowers were fixed in at an absolute max of about 15%, so that's the worst case scenario. 
The median home today costs $430,000 <laughs> and the average interest rate is just over 5%. Or Bro, that's, dude, 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 come on, dude. How do you not see like, how, how do you not see a problem with this, dude? How, how do you not see an issue with this? It's insane, dude. It's like some of the most important goods and services that you need for survival have only skyrocketed in price. The only thing that they've kept consistent for the most part, and that's actually finally changing, is food, okay? Other than food, housing has gotten insanely unaffordable, completely unaffordable. The only viable method to make a more productive labor force, higher education, insanely unaffordable. Wages have remained stagnant. It is psychotic. How do people not look at this and go, D -d -d we need to fix this, this is insane. Like, no wonder we have a fuckload of homeless people everywhere dude food has gone up 40 percent in the last two years bro no i bro do you not hear what i'm saying food is one of the only commodities that has maintained stability and it's changing over the past two years is exactly what i just said the reason why people are freaking out is because finally two things that two things that have maintained like relative stability in pricing or haven't been hit by like the gigantic impact of inflation have been oil gas prices and food gas prices and food are the two last subsidy or last commodities that have actually not been hit with inflation to the same degree that it is it has been hit with inflation now okay and because that's changing because that's now going up people are like what the f this is completely completely unacceptable and they're right it is unacceptable oh uh price changes from 1997 to 27 and by the way american enterprise institute let me tell you something let me tell you something boys this is a very important chart okay this is a very 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 important chart all the shit that was outsourced okay all the shit that you can produce uh that is outsourced to the chinese manufacturing to overseas manufacturing stayed relatively stable or way below the overall inflation okay since 1997 2017 look at hospital services college textbooks college tuition child care medical care services housing which by the way this is now bananas okay food and beverage i don't think uh, across the board this is correct i think they mean food and beverage they talk about services too like going out to eat okay everything everything that they kept internally that uh has has uh in encountered tremendous corporate consolidation which is what capitalists do have literally skyrocketed in prices you forgot to say wages? Yeah, the wages one. I mean, this is the American Enterprise Institute after all. Uh, this is probably the average, which is uh, relatively top heavy. You know, you got finance and shit like that. And this is before the pandemic, guys. This is what we didn't notice, okay? Also attached fees now and DMV and core systems now to you harder. I mean, dude, those are, those are minuscule problems. This is before we look at, this is before we look at the pandemic, okay? Cheap commodities that you can survive without, with the exception of new cars. Cheap replaceable goods are cheap and affordable and getting even more affordable. Things that you actually need for survival that should be regulated by the government that are actually free at the point of usage in other countries or incredibly cheap as a consequence of regulation have increased by 200%. That's crazy. How can I get a free house? I'm tired of leeching off chance. Anyone here know? Dude, you have a sweet deal, brother. Just just keep it going, you know? Anyway. Or $21,500 per year just in interest payments. Again, this is adjusted for median incomes at the time, so on the surface, these seem pretty comparable. Maybe the younger generations shouldn't be complaining about unaffordable housing after all. A lot of people brush away this comparison by saying that inflation at this time was extremely high. So these higher interest rate payments didn't mean anything. Are you serious? Is this for real? This is a joke, right? Here's the, tw here's the 2000 to December 2021 price changes. So inflation from 1997 to 2017 is around 55.6% overall inflation. Inflation from 2000 to 2021 is 65.5%. Wait, where the f are the wages in this one? Wait, it says U.S. consumer services goods wages. Why is wages? Oh, average hourly wages is right here. Okay. See a little blip in? Yeah. 
Average hourly wages, dude. I would love to find out what the methodology is uh, for this from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, the masses are given treats, cars, clothing, cell phones, computers, TVs to keep the masses placated. Yes. How did hourly wages outpace, infl outpace inflation in the last 20 years? That doesn't check out, right? Um, it probably, it, it's because it's average. I assume maybe like uh, the gigantic difference, the 18. So CEO salaries have raised, what, a thousand percent? Whereas like uh, average salary across the board for, you know, regular working positions have increased by like, what, 18% or something max or not even. Um, that's probably what is, is like, that's probably what is guiding this average uh, or, or greatly swinging it above overall inflation. Like, that's why people like to look at the median rather than the average. Like, the distribution of average wages is heavily skewed by high earners, whereas median wage is basically just the middle. Data is skewed and filled with outliers. That's something my stats teacher told me about salaries and wages. Yes, of course. When you have the salary, like the CEO compensation, when you have the CEO compensation, um, you know, when you have your CEO compensation increase by 2,000% and, and like the, the, uh, the normal working class jobs, not, uh, not exactly matching that it greatly skews the average in a particular way. That's why median wages are significantly lower. Like if you were to look at the median wage and the increase in the median wage uh, over the course of this exact same period, rather than the average wage, you would see uh, that uh, that has not kept up with overall inflation. CEO compensation has grown 940 percent since 1978 for the typical worker. I thought it's more than that. Means are skewed by outliers. That's why medians are more useful. Data sets that have extreme outliers like extreme income inequality. Yes. Chatter clap live on stream. Oh, I didn't clap anybody. Median weekly earners uh, a full time wage and salary workers from 1979 to 2020. You guys give me that. Median wage in 1980 was 21K, which equals to 75K today. Median wage today is 34K. I did. Yeah, 12 feet.io doesn't work, actually. Bro, stop sending me the hot dog combo. I know, dude. Yes, price stability. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Costco hot dog maintains the same price as 1988. I know. I love Costco, okay? I know. Please stop sending me the same link over and over again. Every time we talk about goddamn inflation, okay? I know, I know. Costco's doing a great job, okay? Costco CEO once famously told that he would kill one of the managers because they tried to suggest increasing the price of uh, the Costco hot dogs. I know, I know. It's a common meme that we literally reference every time. I'm looking for a very specific statistic. They're like, dude, look at the Costco hot dog. Look at the Costco hot dog. Look at the Costco hot dog. Like, I know, I know, dude. I saw it. Thank you for the screenshot. Thank you, Jesus Christ. Thank you, probably top of the hour. I love you. Thank you. Here's the median inflation adjusted hourly earnings of wage and salary workers in the United States from 1979 to 2020, okay? The adjusted hourly earnings of wage and salary workers in the United States from 1979 in constant 2020 US dollars, $14, only raised up to $16. Um, I would like to match this up with uh, the actual... I wish we could figure out what the... F God damn it. I just want literally... Not the hourly earnings, median annual salary, median annual salary or weekly earnings. Fuck it. Versus the cost of living. That's what I want to match up between 1979 to 2020. Thank you. Holy. F Here's the median household income in the United States from 1990 to 2020. Okay. 54,000 to, uh, in 2020, 67,000. So that jump is not as uh, is not as big as uh, as as inflation is. Productivity not included, of course, not included. Obviously, I want this number to go super high because you argue that inflation adjusted medium wage grass could reasonably be flat. Home price, the median annual household income, housing bubble. Historically, the average house in the U.S. has cost around five times the yearly household income. During the housing bubble, the ratio exceeded seven. In other words, an average single family house in the United States costs more than seven times the U.S. median annual household income. What is that now then? If it's $400,000 now, what is, the, what is the median salary now? I guess the video would probably discern that. But that's actually not true. Inflation in 1985 one. was three and a half percent. So we've passed the housing bubble. Oh my God. If the median salary now is, is literally... Income, thousand inflation adjusted for 
adjusted for inflation. Okay, I'm having a, a hot flash, yes. Okay. Percent. And while it was as high as 13.5% in 1980, this was consumer price index inflation, not housing inflation. The prices of houses throughout these decades actually grew at a relatively modest rate. It was everything else that was getting expensive. This is kind of the opposite of what we expect today, where house price growth outpaces inflation. But that was not the case in the 70s and the 80s. So yeah, the inflation argument isn't totally fair. So is it fair to complain about how easy it was for baby boomers to buy a house? Well, no. They still had it easy for two other big reasons. It's not what you would expect, but the higher interest rates actually kind of helped them. Saving money for a deposit in an account that pays 10% interest per year really accelerates that savings goal. Higher interest rates also ensure that house prices never got too high because the repayments would just become unaffordable. In our example from before, we were looking at interest paid on the loans from two time periods. But the thing with a mortgage is you gotta pay back the principal as well. Paying back the principal on a $430,000 mortgage over a standard 30 year loan term will cost an additional $14,300 per year, bringing the total annual repayment to just under $36,000. The house from 1985 would have a principal repayment of $3,000 per year, bringing the total repayment to just over $18,000 per year, half of what the 2022 home buyer would be paying, despite interest rates being three times higher. Put another way, if the repayments were kept equal, the person buying the home in 1985 could have it paid off in five years rather than 30 years. So why am I focusing so much on housing? Well, despite being a very important part of our lives, Houses are also uniquely unproductive. Real estate is kind of unique as an asset class because it doesn't produce anything of value. A house sitting on a block of land can appreciate in value and can provide a home to its owners or a rental income stream to an investor, but it doesn't make anything. Of course, there are other investments today, True. like cryptocurrencies, that also don't produce anything of value, but their market is minuscule next to the market for real estate around the world minuscule and also irrelevant. If the value of Bitcoin goes to a million dollars, well, that's great for the people that invest in it, and it will have some minor knock-on impacts in other markets as people cash out to buy whatever Luxury crypto millionaires cars. buy, but it's not gonna put anybody out on the street. Housing affordability can do that, and it can also slow the progress of entire economies. No, not can, does do that. That is exactly what it does. Housing affordability, is the primary reason for homelessness. It is not mental health, it's nothing else. It is being priced out of the housing market. That's it, number one. No number two, okay? It's such a giant number one that ridiculous that anyone even would ever... Having this conversation in America unironically feels like having every other conversation in America. Just foolhardy endeavor. It feels like I'm having a conversation about gun control. It's like, look at this graph. Country with no guns equals country with no gun violence. Look at this graph. Country with guns equals country with more gun violence. Okay? Country with more guns, more gun violence. It's that simple. No guns means no gun violence. Not talking about, like, how difficult it is as a political move to, you know, actually ban guns or whatever the f Just simply, though, if you have no guns, you have no gun violence. Same goes for housing. Country where there's affordable housing, less homelessness. Countries that have actually implemented social housing as a part of the broad offerings of the government that is given unconditionally to the, uh, to the citizens have less homelessness. It's that easy. And yet Americans are like, la 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 la, can't hear you. What's next? You're gonna tell me you need to treat prisoners with dignity like they're real human beings? Oh wait, you're gonna tell me that countries where they actually do have better integration programs, where prisoners are not kept under inhumane conditions, have significantly lower recidivism rates? Get the f*** out of here, you pussy ass commie! Freedom ain't free, mother Like, that's what, that's what it is. Every single time I'm like, here, look at this example. This is what works. They're like, la 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 la, f you, bitch, commie. This is how ridiculous as it is in New York City. This little plot of land is 800,000. This unit right here is $2 million. I'm guessing this person that owns it, right there. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you, that's a $2 million home in a neighborhood where the average household income is around $33,000 a year. Again, this is in a neighborhood with the highest concentration 
of projects in any neighborhood in New York City. This house right here is Holy f It was 8x in 2007 at the housing bubble in Phoenix. Phoenix was overvalued. Now it is higher than that. 8.5 is at its peak currently. That's awesome. The home price per earnings ratio is worse than the 2007 housing bubble. Here is listed at 2.1 million and it's completely gutted, meaning you'd have to build it up from the bare bones. That's going to take a cool couple stacks. This one's straight up abandoned, but they refuse to list it. As is this one, which is owned by the city of New York. It used to be a uh, boy's home and now it's just sitting vacant along with this church, which has been under construction for all the years that I've lived in this neighborhood. This plot of land here is for sale, but only if it goes with these two buildings alongside it. It all comes down to the fact that they're willing to highly value our neighborhood as long as we're not the ones owning it. This little plot of land is 800 the the unfortunate reality is that making those houses work which is what an adequate government would do which is what a government that cares about its citizens would do would mean putting the lives and sanctity and safety and security of the citizens over the interests of profits okay and that would mean that the two million dollar property that that other dude owns would be devalued it would no longer be two million dollars why the would you pay $2 million when there's a government housing right next door that is actually significantly cheaper and is housing a bunch of people? All of a sudden, demand is lower as well, not even to purchase, but to also uh, to rent uh, in that $2 million house if you want to rent a, a, a you know room in that fucking house. Uh, yeah, and that is at the heart of this problem. It is significantly better for uh real estate developers well not real estate developers necessarily but like people who own real estate which is the primary form of wealth building in this country it is seen as an investment vehicle uh and and people with like even a little bit of leverage and a little bit of fucking power because homeowners do have that will end up urging the government to operate uh to uh, operate in a way that is consistent with their profit margins with their profit motive making the housing prices go up year over year that's where this issue is coming from Every economy in the world is still, for better or worse, focused around large centres of economic activity, what a regular person might call a city. If the real estate in these cities becomes too expensive, then it becomes infeasible for workers to hold down jobs there because more and more of their income will just go to paying rent. In the short term this can be offset by higher wages, but then these centres are really just operating for the benefit of the landlords that are lucky enough to own property there. The money that landlords make from their properties are unlikely to be reinvested into company growth or spent on regular consumer consumption that keeps these businesses in business. It is likely to be spent on more property, further driving up market values and the amount of money that gets sucked out of productive centres to be shoved into unproductive assets. Higher house prices also reduce social and geographical mobility. A 2020 Pew Research study found that 52% of young American adults between the ages of 18 and 28 still live at home with their parents. One could also reasonably assume that this number is higher after two years of COVID and record high house price growth. Please be careful on public housing. We can't repeat the mistakes of the 1950s and built gentrificated pockets of extreme poverty and crime. Public housing must be distributed throughout the community. Yeah, dude, I'm always thinking about not the incredible amount of hurdles to even build public housing, but instead the, the in pockets of crime that's going to come along with it dude like how the f when we're talking about building more housing how the f do you always how do liberals always find a way to like you no know, the funniest thing about yimbies okay the yes in my backyarders okay the 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 where the right wing and the social democrats just somehow merge the funniest thing about that is that they always have a f nimby ass talking point when it comes down to like affordable housing I mean, I agree. I agree in diversifying, uh, uh, you know, neighborhood income. I, I don't have an issue with that at all. But uh, I would like for some affordable housing to exist. These young adults are financially bound to where their parents live. If they get offered a really good job in a different city, they would have to decide if it's worth the pay increase versus the increased cost of living on their own. If they decide it's not, then they miss out on a good job and a business misses out on a productive worker. The concentration of wealth in a particular generation is something that can have very real consequences for entire economies, and these effects are only going to get more pronounced as populations continue to age. Places like Japan are clear examples of this, and they don't have the same kind of housing problems that we do in the West. But long term, does this even matter? I don't want to get too morbid here, but 
people eventually die and their wealth will get transferred down to their children or some other beneficiary. So the concentration of wealth in a single generation is at worst a transient issue. I actually made an entire video last year about the great wealth transfer, which is the process of the baby boomers dying and leaving their wealth behind. The problem we discovered in that video was that a lot of the wealth that is being passed- Like if you think the 1950s, if you think the 1950s like uh, social housing problem, like the projects that were built in the 1950s uh, were, were an issue because it created pockets of crime because of the way that housing was built and not necessarily because of literal segregation, I don't know what to tell you, you know what I mean? Like you got a situation where you have literal segregation, okay, and redlining, and you're still finding a way to like uh, to talk about pockets of crime as a consequence of public housing, Section 8 housing, like projects being built. That's crazy. Like in that situation, it's not public housing that is an issue. White supremacy. Down is coming in the form of private family businesses. In brief, the problem with that is that often these small businesses need the owner to continue operations and the people that stand to inherit these businesses are either unwilling or unable to run them. Small businesses are a huge part of the economy, and losing them will do a lot of harm. Now a glimmer of hope here is that these businesses can be sold by their inheritors to people that do have the skills and desire needed to run them. Perhaps they will sell them to people who have themselves got the money they need to buy the business from their own inheritances. The problem here is the type of people that will actually be receiving this money. Most people don't receive money from their parents passing until they are pretty old themselves, often approaching the end of their careers or starting retirement. Not necessarily for crime, but mixing public housing in all neighborhoods has verified positive effects on social mobility. I 100% agree. I do agree with that. I think having, I mean, mixed income housing is a scary prospect given what I've seen, what, what it means usually. Like I believe in mixed income housing. I think that's great. But oftentimes that's just used as a way to just build luxury condos with like 10, 10 units that are dog shit with a, with a lottery system that is uh, for, you know, hundreds of thousands of potential renters. You know what I mean? And that's exactly what happens in New York. So much so that New York actually literally fucking, instead of doing like hostile architecture, classist architecture, where they have the poor door and, and like different sections of the luxury condos specifically for those poor people who are fortunate enough to be able to get these affordable units uh through the lottery process they have literally moved um entire housing units into separate buildings down the street uh where they where they create like sister apartment complexes where they're like okay this is the luxury condominiums and then down the street is the shitty apartment uh that we're using to justify however many uh, slots we have for affordable housing and that's how they do that's basically how they run every city now they have mixed housing in new york city billionaires and homeless people can live on the same street yeah i looked into a rent control building and it's really weird to think that just based on timing some of my neighbors pay less way more pay way less for my same apartment and some pay way more yeah ultimately my goal has always been and i've been very consistent on this i've been talking about this and i think this is what many leftists like true goal should be which is to decommodify housing as best as you can like rent control and whatnot are oftentimes seen as solutions that end up creating more problems. Okay. Um, however, I don't have a problem with any of those situations, any of those, uh, any of those, uh, uh, like even band-aid solutions, as long as it's working towards decommodifying housing, because that's what should happen. The government should make it unaffordable to be a landlord rather than the exact opposite. The government, um, has made it as easy as possible originally to own a house, right? And that was great originally. But then a lot of people used the uh, benefits of uh, first-time home ownership to be able to purchase multiple properties and continue purchasing properties, making it like one of the most secure, uh, most protected, most protected assets that you can purchase. Because so many people have it and use it as an investment vehicle to generate wealth. If the money gets handed down to them, they are likely just going to use it to fund their own retirements and then just hand down whatever's left to their own elderly children. Money pooling in the hands of older people means less opportunity will be afforded to younger people to do all of the things that they do to build a functioning economy. Buying a house, getting a good job, and you know, starting a family so that there is a continual supply of workers to run an economy. You can't run an economy on people waiting to get old enough to finally do something with their lives. Economists call this the intergenerational wealth problem. 
I like to call it the Prince Charles paradox, but it is something that we are going to have to address. Things like wealth and estate taxes are commonly proposed solutions, but even if they did work, they are going to be very unpopular amongst the huge voting bloc that got us here in the first place. The final thing we've got to ask ourselves is, is this all the boomers' fault? I know a little bit of intergenerational bickering is all good fun, but blaming our current economic issues on a single generation is not going to be very productive. Voting in your own best interests and policies being enacted in the best interests of the majority is the foundation of democracy, and I don't think that anybody is reasonably going to argue that this is a bad thing. I think it's also very important to look at examples of economies where this has not happened. The second largest economy in the world, China, is a great counterexample. Their generational baby boomers are known locally as the lost generation because they spent most of their working life in a dysfunctional economic system. They were also too old to truly benefit from the rapid economic expansion that took place. You know what's really funny? Like, okay, 1438, 14 minutes into the video, he said, uh, they're, law they're known as the lost generation because of a dysfunctional economic system. I just want to go back to the beginning of this video really quickly to mention something that he brought up. A society grows great when old men plant trees whose shade they know they shall never sit in. In the same exact video, he started off talking about a society growing great when old men plant trees whose shade they'll never sit in, and then quite literally said that the prior generation never reaped the rewards of, of you know, China's current prosperity in a matter of 14 minutes. Like, what the f*** do you think that is, dude? That's the point. That's literally the point of what was happening in that situation in China. The second largest economy in the world, China, is a great counterexample. Their generational baby boomers are known locally as the lost generation because they spent most of their working life in a dysfunctional economic system. They were also too old to truly benefit from the rapid economic expansion that took place in the decades after the economy started opening up. First, I was this just meant kidding. that despite still I'm being a large video, portion of which the population, video? they did not enjoy the same economic prosperity as their Western peers. Economic prosperity was also something that the boomers enjoyed that wasn't necessarily within their control. The last half of the 20th century, by historical standards, was very peaceful. The world also opened up to international- The interview you did. Bro, this dude is three seconds away from a self-report, like a major self-report. Are you talking about the complex interview? Are you talking about the way that you misunderstood that uh, that complex interview is a consequence of the community that you're engaged in that routinely uses that video to be like, oh, he made himself. He's such a liar, uh, especially when I've talked time and time again about how I'm not a self-made man. How are you a 10 month subscriber and have uh, subjected yourself to this level of brain rot and still, uh, you know, work in this uh, still still in here? The interview you did, the interview you've already come on, go ahead. Come on. Give it to us, dude. Give it. I already did the whole feel about like, look, man, if you're coming from these if you're coming from these shitty places on the internet where you feel uh, like, uh, you know, it's justifiable to just like fucking come in here and, and, and uh, you know, and engage in this kind of behavior to like derail the stream because you think it's like appropriate to do. I don't know what to tell you, but uh, it just only shows. Talking to someone who's been on Twitch since 2012, motherfucker, you're wasting your time. Yeah, that's probably true. You can get better, I promise. And you will. Trade and growth was put into overdrive by an abundance of cheap energy in the form of fossil fuels. It was a great time to make a fortune, and people did, which is probably the final piece of the puzzle. Once people become extremely rich, and I'm talking about multi-millionaires and billionaires here, they don't normally become poor again. The clump of billionaires that came from this generation will be skewing these figures to make them look worse than they really are. Remember, in a group with one billionaire and 999 people who are completely broke, the average member of that group is a millionaire. Most billionaires are pretty old, and these people will be making outsized impacts on their generational wealth statistics. Again, if we look at billionaires by age in China, a country where voting by the general population doesn't really happen in the traditional sense, we can clearly see that wealth comes from periods of strong economic conditions not just having the ability to bend public policy to suit you and your peers. Although, of course, I'm sure it doesn't hurt. He admits that capital accumulation is a thing, but then he says that billionaires having outsized wealth means that everyone actually has more wealth. A rising tide lifts all boats. 
find all evidence to the contrary. I'm not actually sure about Swatters. Web of Make Believe Death Lies on the Internet is a six part anthology series from director Illuminate Media. Web of Modern Misinformation and Digital Deception, Haunting, Bizarre, Up to Moment, Relevant series explores the consequences of swatting. Dude, I don't want to watch that. What are you crazy? I don't want to watch that at all. If anything, I want to watch the top of the hour ad break. But you might not want to watch that top of the hour ad break. And if you no longer want to watch the top of the hour ad break, then all you need to do is subscribe, which you can do for five dollars for free with the Twitch Prime. That's right. Here's the one minute ad break now. That was cool. I, I feel cool as I'm not gonna lie, that was easy peasy. Hey, if you like this video, please subscribe and hit that bell so you don't miss out on any future videos. <laughs>